Um, thank you very much, Jack. Um, you've already heard the phrase, the science of wear, many times this morning, and you're about to hear it a lot more um, because you will hear Esri using that phrase as one of its ways of characterizing what it does. And so I was asked to talk about the science of wear briefly this morning to introduce the topic. And uh, I'll do that very quickly. I realize I'm probably the last thing between you and lunch. Um, so let me just uh, move fairly quickly. So I think there are two ways of understanding this phrase, the science of wear. The first is the idea of doing science with GIS. And that's something fairly straightforward. It's about making discoveries using GIS technology. And it's been growing over the years to where it is now, GIS is now essentially a massively important tool for anyone in the social sciences and in the environmental sciences. The other, if you could advance, is GIS itself as a science. And this is something that I feel very, very strongly about personally, but it is the more difficult of these two concepts, and so I want to spend a little bit of time on that. But let's first go to just a few quick examples of doing science with GIS. This is a fascinating area in the study of birds, in which birds as small as this little Swainson's thrush are being equipped with tracking devices so that we can now track them as they migrate and see what they're doing. If you go to the next one, here is uh, the result of tracking a purple martin and a wood thrush from eastern North America down into their uh, winter habitat in South America. A very powerful new source of data and a new source of understanding of what is going on in the bird world. The next one, please. Um, this is something much more about social science. This is a child in London who lives in a location, in a house, and every day walks to school. And if you're into the science of public health, you understand the importance of this form of exercise to a child. And by simply tracking the child, we were able to compute the rate at which the child is using energy. And the color on the track, the red, indicates the highest rate of metabolic uh, activity, um, the, the highest rate of use of energy by the child. What has happened, of course, is the child goes through a park, and while crossing the park, is motivated to run and kick a ball around and then finally make, make his or her way to school. The next one, please. Um, here is the use of GIS to study the transition of land use. In this case, in uh, Rondonia, in Brazil, in three time periods, this is 1975, the next one is 1986, and the next one is 1992. And with this kind of data, we can now build models of how land use change occurs in an area like Brazil. And on a related topic, here is a model of land use transition in the Netherlands, building a scientific model based on data of how land use change occurs and what policy changes would change that land use transition, expressed here as a table and now as a series of maps. We're doing a lot of work with GIS to study crowd behavior and to study how small changes of policy can prevent massive accidents, such as the ones that have occurred in the Hajj in Mecca over, um, many, over many years. Here is some work of one of my former students comparing the economy of China to the economy of the United States and looking at the extent to which different parts of China behave economically in a way which is quite different from their surroundings. Um, specifically, Shanghai, Guangzhou, and Beijing do not follow the same rules, the same scientific principles that other parts of the Chinese economy do. And this one I like particularly. This is a very important map in the history of public health. This is a map of the United States by county, and it shows cancer mortality, the rate of death due to cancer of the throat and lungs among white males between 1950 and 1969. And what you do when you look at this, it's a very powerful way of doing this, is to identify the particular counties which show 
which showed a very high rate of cancer. And you notice that all the way around the coast of the United States, in the port cities, there was a very high rate of cancer. And this map is literally one of the most important pieces of evidence for the realization, the discovery, that asbestos is a major cause of cancer of the respiratory system. A map really driving a particular area of science. So that was, in a way, the easy one, GIS being used for science. The other interpretation, which to me has been far more important over the years, is the idea that GIS is itself a science. And this goes back to the early 1990s, when a lot of us in GIS were being criticized by our colleagues for doing something which appeared to be no more than, no more important than learning how to run Microsoft Excel. It was a simple, a simple computer-based tool, and anyone could do it. Learning GIS was just a matter of learning which keys to push. And we thought otherwise. We thought, no, GIS really is a science. You have to think hard about it, and there are discoveries to be made. What, are, what is the knowledge that enables geographic information systems? What scientific knowledge makes GIS possible? And what are the principles that govern how the geographic world is constructed? These are very important pieces of science. And over 10 years, we were able to show that GIS was indeed a science. And let me just take you through a couple of examples of this, this point. Here's a map of southeastern England. And it shows the uh, percentage of the population that are pensioners. And what your eye immediately does in looking at a map like that is to pick out the outliers. Why are there particular, these are very small areas, why are there small areas which have a high percentage of old age pensioners? You can see the broad pattern. People in Britain like to move out of central London when they get older, and they like to move to the south coast. But where are the exceptions? Where are the outliers? And that's what the eye is very good at doing. You might, if you can, uh, in the top left-hand corner, you can see a bright red area. What is special about that area? Why does it stand out? And what we're doing here is applying a very important principle. If you go to the next one, please. And this is a principle that today is known as Tobler's First Law of Geography. And it says something extremely simple. It says, nearby things are more similar than distant things. What could be simpler than that? But what does it mean? It means that if you see something which is not like its neighbors, it's automatically interesting and important. And what does it mean? It means that without it, we couldn't do contour mapping. We couldn't do spatial interpolation. Half of what we do with GIS would not work if this very simple principle was not true. Now let's go to the next one. What I'm going to do is illustrate the two most important principles that GIS as a science has discovered. And this one is the Yucatan Peninsula of Central America, and it shows part of Mexico, part of uh, Belize, and part of Guatemala. And what you notice immediately, this is soil mapping, what you notice immediately is how the boundaries, the national boundaries, stand out. The boundary of Guatemala stands out very clearly, the boundary between the state of Quintana Roo and the state of Chiapas in Mexico stands out very clearly. And this is not because soils were designed to, to follow national boundaries. It's because mapping practice in these different jurisdictions is different. So that when you lay soil maps up against each other and they cross national boundaries, you can see the national boundary. It's not there in the soils. It's simply a matter of mapping practice. So what's the principle here? The principle is that the Earth's surface is not uniform, and that if you let a local jurisdiction, such as the government of Belize, manage soil mapping, it will do something different from what it would have done if it was Guatemala. That's a very basic principle. If you could go to the next one, this is the principle of spatial heterogeneity. It's why it's so difficult to generalize about geography. Why it's so important to use GIS to study different parts of the world and not simply to assume that the world's all the same. 
a tremendously important and very profound principle. So this is why there are local standards and why interoperability between local jurisdictions is such an issue. In the state of Wisconsin, for example, with 72 counties, there are exactly 72 different schemes for classifying land use because each county uses what's best for itself. So it's a very profound principle. And there are two principles then, which to me form the foundation of the science of GIS. And the next one, please. This is another example. Here are some of the different ellipsoids, which have been used by different parts of the world. And it wasn't until, the next one, please. It wasn't until we agreed on WGS 84, the next one, that we had a universal standard. And notice, WGS 84, while it's ideal for the whole world, is not optimal for any one part of the world. Everyone had to compromise to come up with a uniform standard. So the last slide, please. So a quick summary, using GIS to do science, to acquire knowledge about the world, about how it looks and works, all across the social and environmental sciences. And then the second point, the next one, please, GIS itself as a science, the scientific basis for GIS technology. Thank you very much for your attention.